to join the site. Yeah, um, her role involves uh, conceptualizing, delivering and evaluating assessment solutions for institutional and government clients. Some of her recent projects include leading on the localization of APTIS for the workplace literacy and numeracy assessments for Skills Future Singapore and academic leadership for a bespoke IELTS preparation course for Health Education England, which is an agency of the NHS in the UK, which is in collaboration with British Council English and Exams India. Joanna's background is as an English language teacher and academic. She has taught English and applied linguistics and research aspects of teaching, learning assessment in a variety of contexts. Her current passion is playing tennis, but when she has to work for a living, she's very happy to work on impactful projects which leverage the power of tests for positive educational and societal change. Okay, Giovanna, over to you then. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, John, and thank you to everyone who's decided to share this, um, this time on a Friday with me. I'm going to start out with um, a little sort of confession or, or acknowledgement of something slightly uh, perhaps prescient that happened when I was writing the abstract for this talk. Uh, those of you who've had a look at it recently will have seen that I wrote in the third paragraph uh, a little bit of a hedge. I actually said that this, um, this presentation um, will talk about the performance of listening test items compared with the performance of the items as recorded for the originator versions in pre-testing and where possible in live administration with international candidate groups. I didn't know what was going to happen in 2020, um, but for some reason I, I slipped those words where possible in. And as we go along, you'll see that um, the plans that I had for this talk um, didn't quite come through but I still think there are some interesting comments to be made and, and some interesting um, data to look at very quickly tonight. I say tonight because I'm sitting in Melbourne talking to you, so I'm a few hours ahead of Singapore, um, but thank you very much for joining. Let's start off by making sure that everyone understands uh, what we were doing in Singapore um, with the workplace literacy and numeracy testing. Um, in assessment solutions in, in the part of global assessments that I work in. We, we work a lot around APTIS, which is the British Council's um, four skills test of English language proficiency. In um, 20, 2020, um, we launched a revision of the listening test. And so with that, we have a revision of the technical report, which you can see there on the left of your screen. Um, and in that revision, um, we, we made some changes to the listening test, which I'm going to be talking about a little bit today. Um, APTIS, if you don't know it well, is a test which has been built on the foundations of the CEFR. Uh, it has tasks that really target performance at the different levels. APTIS General has, in listening, for example, has items that target A1, a2, B1, and B2 listening performance. The other image you have there and, um, is an example of an item specification for an A1 listening task in APTIS. Uh, you can see there that there are very clear specifications around what the candidate needs to do while they're listening to an audio recording. So for example, the kind of information targeted is lexical recognition. Now you can see a bit lower down that um, the length of the audio is going to be 30 seconds. There's only going to be 60 to 80 words in the audio recording, and it's going to be recorded quite slowly. These are really important aspects of the item specification because they help us really target that A1 level of difficulty in the item. Um, I wanted to draw your attention to another aspect of the item specification for APTIS General, which is really important for this talk today. It's the uh, specification around accent. Now for APTIS General, you'll find that 
under that row that says accent, you'll always have standard British English, standard British English speaker likely to be encountered in the UK. And this is Aptus General, and this is what I'm talking about as the originator test in the localization that I'm going to describe today. So what we decided, or what we were asked to do actually, was to take Aptus General listening and, aud and speaking audio files and re-record them into uh, Singapore accent English. So these listening test items that are now recorded in Singapore accent English became the workplace literacy and numeracy assessment in Singapore for listening. There's a lot more to it, but we'll get there. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about today is Aptus General, which has been re-recorded in Singapore accented English using Singapore based voice talent. Um, and then with some slight localizations around content. When I started working in global assessments in, in the British Council, I'd come from, as John mentioned in the introduction, quite an academic position when I was thinking about language testing. I'd, I'd been doing research in, in Washback. Um, I'd been looking at validity and writing tests and um, value implications of writing tests. I didn't really know very much about listening test production. So I had quite a steep learning curve when I joined the team and I became involved in this project. One thing that doesn't really come through very much in the literature, and I think it's because um, people in, who are writing the literature are often coming from an academic perspective, is that listening test production is very expensive. Um, and this is important in uh, international tests because when you go into the recording studio to record listening test items, you have to try and get as many items recorded as you possibly can, uh, meeting all of those specifications. So the items are already written, the script is there. You're making sure that the recording is meeting the specifications in terms of how quickly the actor is speaking, um, how clearly the actor is speaking and how long the audio recording is. So you have all of these things in mind. You've also got in mind that you're paying by the hour for the recording studio, for the recording studio engineer, for the voice talent and for yourself to be there and, and anyone else who's supervising. So what happens then is that you like to have actors working with you who very quickly move through the recordings and they do it very accurately and they understand the pace that they need to speak at and, and how to get the meaning from the script into the recording. If someone does that very well, they're likely to be invited back again to do the same work. But what happens then is that you have the same actors coming back, coming back, um, and you tend to not have a very diverse range of voices in your item bank. This is just a practicality and language testing is always about this compromise between practicalities and challenges and, and theoretical considerations. Um, the other thing that you have in that situation is you have sometimes a suggestion that the actors are very good actors, particularly the ones who come back again and again, and they could perhaps do a different accent to contribute to diversity in the um, item bank. But we're still guided by that part of the item specification that says that we need to have a speaker who is a British English speaker who we're likely to meet on the street. So these are some of the considerations that we have when we're building the international version of the test. But there are also um, discussions about should we be including L2 accents in L2 background accents in international tests? So proficient speakers of English who come from somewhere else. There's been discussion about whether or not we should do this. Um, a strong example is Taylor 2006, 
who said that perhaps what we did, if we were to include a wide range of accents, is we would be rewarding people who had exposure to that wide range of accents um, and perhaps introducing test bias around people who had the resources to travel a lot. Um, there's another argument around using L2 accents in international tests, which is around, you know, is it a matter of luck? So if you're an L2 speaker who happens to meet in your listening test an item which has been recorded by someone with the same language background as you, is there test bias introduced there because you got lucky? So these are some of the conversations that are happening around L2 accents in international tests. The other accent that come, sorry, the other argument that is coming in is the question of target language use domain arguments. So the question is raised, why are you developing this test? And if the test is being developed to perhaps assess people who are working in India and using English as, a, um, as the language of communication in a workplace in India, is it appropriate for them to be assessed um, using British accented English? So the target language use domain argument feeds really nicely into what we did in Singapore, which was to work with Singaporeans who speak English. Um, there's a strong um, movement with the Singaporean government to improve, as you can see here, um, English language use in Singapore. Uh, as it's seen as a really useful internationalization tool to have a population who speak good English. So when we went to the Singapore WPLN and made the decision that we would re-record in Singaporean accented English, the arguments were pretty clear. It is the target language use domain argument that it's fair for candidates in line with the test score use. So the scores on the WPLN are only used in Singapore. And so we can only, we can also only assume that candidates have exposure to English as used in Singapore. Um, Singapore has four um, official languages, Tamil, Malay, English and Mandarin, but English is the language of government and education. The other thing to think about, and this links really nicely to the Speak Good English campaign in Singapore, is that Singapore accented standard English is appropriate for a test of English language listening. So it's almost a movement towards saying, yes, we can use this language, we can use it well, and we can use it in a language test. So what did we do? Very quickly, um, we spent a lot of time in a recording studio in Singapore. We recorded many hundreds of listening and speaking test items. Um, we used many experienced and inexperienced local voice actors. And you'll remember my point before about the value of an experienced actor in a recording studio. I'll mention that a little more later. Um, and we had to maintain that close supervision to ensure that the recordings met the item specification requirements. So that's accuracy, how it links back to the script, uh, the speech rate, the timing and the meaning so I presented on this particular project last year at New Directions in Yokohama. And at this point, um, an experienced test developer said, hold on, re-recording the items, that's great, but there's more to it, right? And so this is where I'm going to go now um, towards the, there's a bit more to it in technical terms than just re-recording the items, putting the, the versions together and, and sending them out there. So we follow the cyclical model of test development um, that actually Judith will be talking about, I think tomorrow again, and about localization and how we do this. Um, today we'll be talking about the second half of this cyclical model of test development a little bit of overlap with the item writing and quality assurance because we had to make sure that we met those quality assurance demands when we were in the recording studio. Um, the piloting and trialing analysis happened on the originator versions, not on the Singapore versions. Um, so this is where the, the question around um, versions and if difficulty is the same or not from the originator versions and the new versions and 
and how we can keep an eye on that. Um, it's important at this point to mention that we did a standard setting in Singapore using Singapore recorded items and versions. So in some ways, the tests themselves split off. So we have the originator tests and then post standard setting, we have the Singapore tests, which means that some of the conversations that I was having in my head and, and with other people are not as relevant as I thought they were. We'll get to that in a moment. Um, and then you can see at the top there, there's the monitoring and, and this report or, or this presentation and this thinking um, links into that idea of monitoring performance after a localization. So I, I don't have my colleagues here with me today, or if I do have them, they're quietly in the audience. Um, but I have to acknowledge here that the assessment research group, um, specifically Richard Spivey and Jamie Dunley, have been very helpful in this piece of work. So thank you very much to both of them. Um, what happened was Richard took four versions of WPLN listening. Um, and the, these were the four versions that had had the most attempts uh, over the last couple of months. Now, unfortunately, due to COVID, we didn't have as many versions um, with as many candidates as we would have hoped, um, but that is what 2020 has done to us. So Richard took four versions and um, ran them through WinSteps, each of those versions. Um, he did it without anchors, so it, the items weren't anchored back to the original pre-testing values. Um, he had a look at the fit statistics for me and then did item maps. Now, Richard is very happy to say that the fit statistics are good. Um, and this is an example of an item map that he did for me. I chose this one to show you because in this one, we have very, very clearly, um, the items are named very clearly. Uh, within our system, our items have two naming protocols, unfortunately. But this is the new one, and it works really nicely for this purpose, because as you'll see, our item map here, this is on version seven, um, very clearly we can see that our A1 items, and you remember I went into some detail before about how the item specifications really tell us what we have to put in an A1 item and an A2 item and a B1 item and a B2 item. We can see from this that the A1 items are, with the exception of one there, um, the easiest items in the test, um, in this version of the test. They're in that pink box at the bottom. Then we have a light blue box, which is our A2 items. So sigh of relief, they're sitting slightly higher there than the A1 items. It's a bit of a gap and we get our B1 items and then above them, the B2 items. So even though we haven't had an anchored analysis and we can't talk about the difficulty of these items with respect to the pretesting values, we can see, and I think this is quite important, that the items are still, and these are Jamie's words, so they're conforming to a unidimensional listening construct in the local context. So the A1 items are still the easiest ones than the A2, the B1, the B2. And this is repeated across the four versions that we've had a look at. We completely understand that we need to do more analysis. And I think it's best if Jamie or Richard talk to you about that, because I'm just going to feel very uncomfortable on those things. So what else can we talk about here? Um, we can't talk about live administration of these versions because there was a revision it was due to roll out around April, May, and because of COVID, we weren't able to do that. We can't make claims for comparable difficulty of the Singapore versions versus the international versions, because that would require an experimental study that we're just probably not gonna do. But we can make claims for comparable quality because we can see that the items are playing out in the way that we expected them to through our item build, and through our quality assurance and through the item specifications. We need to continue to keep an eye on the Singapore versions. Um, we always have to keep in mind that we did a local standard setting. So as I said before, there's this sort of divergence between the originator versions and the Singapore versions. But there's also something else that we can think about, which is the implications for the global test. Um, I mentioned before that we did this revision 
in um, over the last couple of years and and that the Singapore version of the listening test is the first go live attempt of this revision. When we were doing the revision, we invited some anonymous um, test reviewers to come in and talk to us about what was good and what needed improving in the listening test revisions. Two really important points, I think. Um, the first one is thinking about non-native accents and some kind of intelligibility measure that could be implemented um, when we're thinking about using non-native accents. I mentioned before that we used some inexperienced voice actors in the Singapore recordings. And unfortunately, one of them we had to uh, remove from the item bank and re-record his items, which was expensive. Um, but that particular actor didn't have the experience to hit the intelligibility or the clarity of his performance uh, in the recording studio that he'd managed to do on his showreel. So thinking about um, that intelligibility measure and how we could standardize it would be really useful, um, particularly in recruitment. Um, the other question is there, so why not highly proficient non-native users of English? Now, some things that we have to keep in mind, um, and this is around a cautious approach from field 2019, the problem of normalization, normalization, which is when listeners start listening to a new voice, like you did when I started speaking and when John started speaking, you need to get used to the sound of a new voice. If we have um, a lot of different voices in a listening test, we could be disadvantaging, especially lower proficiency candidates, because the, normali the normalization doesn't really start to get good until the candidates are around B2 level. So that's an important thing to think about. Other questions are, you know, what constitutes an L2 variety? Um, you know, what kind of language background, what kind of education background, what kind of um, exposure? All of these things contribute to an individual's accent. The other question that we need to consider is that intelligibility is co-constructed. And there are implications there for test bias. And I think that was picked up in the comment earlier about luck. So to finish off, um, this is a comment from 2013 where um, Field was reviewing things that were happening in listening test production at Cambridge ESOL. But I think similarly, we need to think about this, is that we need to start thinking about standardization in our test field around accent if we're going to be changing them, or even when we are asking in the recording studio in the originator versions for our, um, our voice actors to introduce different accents. So as well as looking at um, the test specifications and what the um, candidate needs to do while they're doing a listening test item, we should also be looking at what kind of accents are we putting in and how does that fit. So I'm going to finish there and say, do we have any questions? Um, and I'll pop through to my references for you to have a look if you're interested. Thank you very much for that, Joanna. Thank you. Um, there is a, a, I don't know if you've got the chat box open or, over there. The, there is a question from Ferret. Um, if you can't see, I can read it out to you. I uh, don't. Okay. Think I can because of okay. Sharing. Fine. Okay. Well, Ferret says maybe IELTS or TOEFL is already doing this, but don't they consider including other accents non-native of English in listening tests? I mean, at least having two speakers, one standard English, British, American, Australian, etc., and the other speaker whose native language is different. Yeah. One of the things that Field says, which is really interesting is that if you have two varieties of English in a dialogue, it becomes even more challenging for low level listeners. Um, so I certainly, I was thinking about this and we're thinking about this with reference to other language test development that we're doing at the moment. But according to Field, if you're below a B2 level listener, having two varieties in a dialogue makes it even harder for the the purpose of that normal normalization where you're 
getting used to vowel sounds, particularly in English, it's the vowel sounds that change when accents change. Um, I've also been looking at IELTS, I'm not so sure about TOEFL, in terms of which languages, um, sorry, which accents they're using. I'm pretty sure that still in IELTS, they're restricted to, uh, you know, the big five, uh, Canada, Australia, UK, America, and New Zealand, being that they're the countries that sort of receive people with IELTS scores the most. Thanks, Joanna. Thanks to Ferret for the question. There's another question here now from Jamie. Um, Accents present an opportunity to differentiate between summative assessment and learning tasks. We can expose students to varieties of accents in classroom tasks with no risk of failure on their part and to sensitize them to the idea of there being difference out there. But in assessment, we need to make sure we have given due diligence to fair measurement. What do you think? I, I, I'm guessing this is Jamie Dunley who's asked this question. <laughs> yes, Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jamie. Um, what do I think? I think with the, the reading I've been doing recently, I think that a cautious approach is a fair approach. Um, I think that the arguments that Taylor makes around exposure um, and around luck are, are very good arguments to make. I think the world has changed a lot since that particular article, so Taylor 2006 was, um, was published. So people have, I, this is an assumption and it's an assumption around um, people who and have a lot of access to digital means, um, so access to the internet and so on. I feel like the exposure argument isn't as strong these days as it was, so that um, I, I feel like learners are probably more exposed to more varieties and more accents than they were 15 or 20 years ago. Um, but I, I think understanding the cognitive process is better. So the, the, the idea of normalization and how that interplays with test difficulty when you're trying to get used to a particular voice, um, I can see that that has quite a large impact. On, on the difficulty of an item. And that's something that I hadn't really given much thought to before. Thanks, Jamie, for the question. There's another comment from Luke Harding here, Joanna. Recent research by Kang et al. shows that with careful speaker selection, a range of accent varieties could be used on any listing test with no great detriment. That's, that's a not a question. Um, yeah, just, <laughs> just a statement. Yeah, just a, a comment you, to, to what I you said. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't read that and I, I'll be very happy to read it. Mm -hmm. There's another question here, Joanna, from Morella Tres Tiongon. Tiongson, sorry, Morella for the pronunciation. Hi, interesting presentation. Don't you think by focusing on intelligibility, you're reinforcing native speaker centrism in that sense? Yeah, that's really interesting um, because the review panel for what was intelligible wasn't only native speakers. Um, yeah, so when we started this project, because we're working for a client, um, there, there are certain decisions that are made for by the client. Um, so when we were selecting the voice actors, that, that was was their decision, um, we could guide it. And I, and I certainly said that we need to have strong representation where we have Malay background speakers, we have Tamil background speakers, we have Chinese background speakers, um, and we have other people who speak other languages at home because that, that's a representation of Singapore. Um, but there is, a, again, and this is the compromise and the, the tension question, um, there, there is a great, degree of intelligibility in that. And I don't know enough about intelligibility and intelligibility measures and how they work and how they work between L2 influence and sort of some sort of general notion of clarity 
Um, so that's certainly something for us to look at in the future. Thanks, and thanks uh, to Morella for the question. Um, Luke, Luke's just uh, come back to apologise, said sorry, I should have made that previous uh, statement into a question, and uh, Morella thanks you for the response. Are there any other questions before we um, close the presentation? Nothing else has come up in the um, in the comment in the chat box, Joanna. So um, okay, well, I'm very happy to jump over to the panel and watch yeah. that. Yeah, well, thanks very much for your presentation, Joanna, and as everyone, and thanks everyone for for participating. Uh, as Joanna has just mentioned, we, we've we've finished here, but if you go over to the plenaries and discussions um, community, the, um, there is a and there are further things on there. At, 60, at 4.40 there's a panel discussion on evidence-driven influence affecting uh, change in educational policy and then at five past six Professor Linda Taylor from Crella UK will be um, hosting a plenary on metaphors we test by so there's still the day's still not over by a long way but for today that's all in in this community so thanks for everyone for coming over and thanks once again joanna for your presentation and uh, hopefully see see you all again tomorrow thanks very thank much thank you very much goodbye All right.